Warning, this episode contains content that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Girl Scouts, their cookies are practically legendary. But in June of 1977, at a camp near Locust Grove, Oklahoma, the girls were anything but cheerful. Dismissed warnings, three chilling murders, and a camp forever changed. All of this and more as we explore the anatomy of murder. It was about 6 a.m. on the morning of June 13, 1977, when Carla Wilhite, a counselor at Camp Scott, went on her way to take her morning shower. But curiosity pulled her away from her usual walk. The night before, strange sounds cried out into the air like an animal, but like no creature she had ever heard before. Carla followed the path down to where she suspected the noise to have come from, only to stumble upon a shocking scene. Three sleeping bags were lying haphazardly beneath a tree, one green, one with a floral design, and one with yellow plaid. Carla inched closer in horror. Beneath the plaid sleeping bag, a young girl named Doris Denise Miller lay dead, nude from the waist down and hands duct taped behind her back. With her in their own sleeping bags, her two murdered tentmates. No one could believe that the events at a summer camp could go so horribly wrong. For nearly 50 years, Camp Scott had been a getaway for Girl Scouts of the Oklahoma area, being located only about 40 miles from Tulsa. It had first opened in 1928 and had over 400 wooded acres for the girls to enjoy, accommodating around 140 campers and 30 staff members. The scouts could hike, craft, swim, and sing around campfires. On the opening day of June 12th, campers were told to pick their tent buddies. New friends 8-year-old Lori Lee Farmer, 9-year-old Michelle Guse, and 10-year-old Doris Denise Miller came together and headed down the cookie trail towards their tent in the Kiawa unit, the most remote unit located furthest from the camp counselors. And even with the only lights coming from their flashlights and the kerosene lanterns hanging at the latrines, there was no reason for the girls to suspect anything wrong. Unfortunately, the counselors didn't know any better, but they probably should have. Leading up to the slayings, there were more than a few warning signs. Earlier in April, during a training session, a counselor's tent was ransacked and a handwritten note was left behind in a donut box, stating that three campers would soon be murdered. Thinking the note was nothing but a prank, it was thrown away and forgotten about. A week before the camp opened, a nearby rancher reported that his house had been broken into. Later, it was known that some of the stolen items were used in the murders. The night before, two of the camp's counselors had been frightened by two strange men found lurking around the camp. But thinking the men were only lost in the woods, they were forgotten too. Some campers said they even saw a man in army boots behind a tent, and another man was seen by a latrine the night of the murders. But with chalking all these things up simply to coincidence, the girls' fates were sealed. As a storm rolled over the area, the campers were sent off into their tents and the camp counselors turned in for the night. Lori, Michelle, and Doris tucked their belongings into the unused fourth bunk and went to sleep in the Kiawa tent. It was after one in the morning on June 13, 1977, that camp counselor Carla Wilhite was awakened by those unknown noises. The counselor recalled it sounded like a cross between a frog and a bullhorn, low and guttural. Carla woke a second counselor to ask if she had heard the noise as well, to no avail. Carla went outside and surveyed the dark woods with her flashlight. Each time her light flashed, the sound stopped. Too tired to keep investigating, she eventually went back to bed. At 2 a.m., one of the Girl Scouts in Tent 7 saw someone pull the tent flap back and shine a light inside. The camper was only able to see the silhouette of what she thought was a large man. The flap closed, and just as quickly as he had appeared, he was gone. 
An incident at 3 a.m. had one girl wake up to a scream coming from the Kiawa tent. Another scout heard a voice cry out, Mama, Mama. She thought she recognized the voice as Lori Lee Farmer. The two had attended camp together before, and knowing Lori sometimes had nightmares, she ignored the cry and went back to sleep. It wasn't until 6 a.m. the next day when Carla found the girls' sleeping bags that anyone knew that something was terribly, terribly wrong. After Carla had alerted camp director Barbara Day of her discovery, Day and her husband, Richard, ran to the site. After confirming Doris was dead, they lifted the other sleeping bags and realized two more crumpled bodies were in them. The police were called immediately. The investigation showed that Michelle and Lori had been struck in the tent, dying of blunt force trauma to the head. Michelle's head wounds led investigators to believe that she was either lying down or standing with her back to the assailant. There was also evidence that she had been sexually assaulted both vaginally and anally. Doris had met a similar fate. She had been taken into the woods and then strangled after also suffering a massive blow to the head. There were indications that she too had been sexually assaulted. Unlike the other two, all swabs taken from Lori were negative for any seminal fluid. The blood on the wooden tent floor was wiped by the attacker or attackers with mattress covers and towels in an unsuccessful attempt to rid the floor of it. The bloody materials were then stuffed in the sleeping bags. Military boot footprints were found at the scene as well as a large roll of black duct tape, a red and white 9 volt flashlight, rope, a gag, and two photos of unknown women. The women in the photos were identified after their images appeared in several newspapers. These photos and other evidence led police to suspect Jean Leroy Hart. Jean Leroy Hart was a Cherokee Native American born and raised in Locust Grove. In 1966, 11 years prior, Hart had confessed to kidnapping, raping, and sodomizing two pregnant women in Tulsa. He was sentenced to 28 months in jail, and in 1970, Hart was convicted of a series of burglaries and sentenced to over 300 years. Three years later, Jean had escaped. He was still at large when the Girl Scout murders occurred. Jean was diligently pursued and was apprehended 10 months later, but there were many that believed that Hart was innocent, using the man's vasectomy as a defense and arguing that sperm evidence could not be connected to him. With a jury of six men and six women, the trial began in March of 1979. Unable to find indisputable evidence against Hart, he was acquitted in April, but returned to prison to finish his previous sentence. Within weeks of his return, Hart was found dead. At 35 years old, his autopsy revealed he had died of a massive heart attack and that the vasectomy surgery had not been successful. With their leading suspect dead, the case went unsolved. In the years since the triple slaying, evidence has been retested on multiple occasions, each time using the latest available technology and each time yielding no new information. It seems the case may never be solved through forensic testing simply because too much time has passed. The murderer of Lori Lee Farmer, Michelle Guse, and Doris Denise Miller may never be known. As for the camp, no Girl Scout has ever taken the cookie trail to Camp Scott. It remains overtaken by weeds and other plant life, leading to the dilapidated lodges that have sat idle and vacant since the horrific deaths of three young girls. That's all for this episode. Be sure to subscribe to my channel now because you won't want to miss what's next. Also, don't forget to check out my last episode covering the infamous serial killer, Albert Fish. You can either press on screen or the link in the description below this video. And I'll see you next Sunday.